Hi, everybody, um, and welcome or welcome back to Ground Truthing 201, um, the second part of Bark's Ground Truthing training uh, to talk about Bark's work in the forest monitoring timber proposals. Um, I'm Misha. I'm Bark's Forest Watch Assistant. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I've been with Bark for about a year. Check. <laughs> And hey everyone again, my name is Michael Crocta and I'm Barks Forest Watch Coordinator. And yeah, I just really appreciate everyone being here for a Zoom meeting on such a beautiful sunny day. And yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to uh talking about ground truthing with you all and and getting out to the forest with you all soon. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna just talk about a couple quick um, housekeeping things. So we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things today. And, you know, at any time, if you have a question, you can go ahead and enter that in the chat. We are going to have sort of some structured Q and A's at various times throughout the talk today. Um, and then there's also going to be a few times where we're going to be asking the people participate if you'd like. Um, and during those times, you can, you're definitely welcome to Go ahead and unmute yourself if you've got something to say. Um, at other times, we want to ask that folks stay muted just so we can um, keep things moving and um, get everyone out and hopefully outside um, as soon as possible today because it is beautiful outside. So um, I think that's it for housekeeping. Uh, yeah, just hope you all enjoy the talk. And I'll hand it back over to Misha. Okay. Um, we're going to get started with Bark's land acknowledgement practice. All right. Um, as an organization founded by white people in the lineage of settler colonial environmentalism, Bark understands that conservation work is embedded in the white supremacist legacy of colonization, of land theft, cultural erasure and genocide, and the systemic use of law to suppress native sovereignty over their homelands. We understand that Bark's dedication to protecting the stolen lands referred to now as the public lands of Mount Hood National Forest carries with it a paradox which continues to be ignored by most conservation groups and which continues to harm indigenous people. In our advocacy and policy work, Bark's interactions with the federal agencies often comply with the authority assumed by the US federal government. This authority was assumed through the legalized displacement and genocide of indigenous people and cultures, including through the legislative creation of public lands. These crimes and injustices have not been reconciled nor rectified. Today, all non-native people have the privilege of primary access to these public lands as a direct result of this strategy of legalized supremacy. Bark recognizes that conservation organizations like ours are complicitly participating in the ongoing displacement of native people and culture each time settlers and other non-indigenous people claim the benefits of access to this land and by engaging the paradox of protecting stolen land. We are working to change the vision, mission, and strategies of our organization. Bark affirms that these are the rightful homelands of the Multnomah, Malala, Kalapuya, Chinook, Clackamas, Tenino, Wasco, Wishram, Paiute, and many other Native people who live here and who have always lived here, who have always belonged to and cared for this land, and whose bold resistance to colonial oppression should guide us all. Now, I would like to respectfully invite any Native people here today to have a few minutes to speak freely. If you'd like to speak, you can go ahead and unmute yourself or type in the chat. Um, so now we'll move on to our land acknowledgement practice. Um, if you were with us last time or if you've been to a recent Bark event, go ahead and grab a notebook, um, preferably the notebook that you used before. Um, if you haven't practiced this before, please go get something to write with. Let's give a few moments to do that. Um, Bark is committing to the work necessary to repair relationships between settler descendants and indigenous people, and between all non-indigenous people and the land. Acknowledgement is just the necessary first step in this revolutionary cultural work. 
we ask all non-Indigenous participants in our work to practice humility, respect, and acknowledgement with us by personally dedicating your time, energy, action, and resources to support the people who rightfully belong to this land. Please take the next two to three minutes to write some instructions, intentions, actions, and next steps for yourself, outlining how you will develop your practice of acknowledgement through action. If you have been to a recent BARC event, please revisit what you have set out for yourself to do and take this time to reflect on your efforts and update your intention and action plan. Please take the next 30 seconds or so to wrap up your writing. Okay. Um, now please set aside your journal um, and turn your attention away from yourself and please join me in a moment of respectful silence and contemplation and humiliation of the original people um, in honor of the original people here tonight across this continent in the past, present, and the future. Right. Um, thank you, everyone, for supporting this important practice and learning. Um, it's important that we continue um, to practice acknowledgement through action in all areas of our lives. Um, Michael, would you like to get us started? Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Misha, for that. Um, I want to just remind folks, this is part two of a two part training. And if you did miss part one, which we did back on Thursday, that's totally fine. Uh, we have, we've recorded that part of this training and we can share that video with you so you can, you can catch up with things. 
Um, today, we're going to be discussing the process of ground truthing in the forest. So, you know, some of the things that we're looking for, some of the ways, different ways to look at it and, and the why as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you all know, this is very different than how we usually do these trainings. So usually this, this part two of this training is a full day together in the forest. Um, but uh, we're, we think that you will we'll still be able to get something out of this training. And, um, and when you're able to come out with us to the forest later in the spring and summer in person, uh, you'll be able to get some, some firsthand experience there uh, after you get some of the context here today. So just a little bit of review of some of the things that we talked about on Thursday, just to kind of ground us. So we talked on Thursday a lot about sort of the context of, of where we do this work and why. We also talked a bit about how to find out about timber sales, where they're being planned, when, um, how to sort of dig into some of the rationale behind some of them. Uh, talked about kind of the an outline of the basic planning process under the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, including um, scoping letters and comment periods, environmental, environmental analysis. And, and then we kind of ended things with how to uh, then take that information and navigate to where the logging is being proposed um, at the timber sale unit level. And so this is kind of where we're starting off today where we're going to be talking about more of the physical act of ground truthing um, and being out in the forest collecting that information that we're uh, that Bark uses so often as folks are doing in some of these images here. So just, um, you know, to start from the beginning, Bark at our office, we have all of the gear and resources that you might need to be able to participate in this work. You know, we've got field guides, tools, clipboards, uh, all that stuff. Um, so we will provide all of that. We do encourage folks, if you're interested, and especially if you're planning on going out to the forest on your own, uh, getting some maps, some paper maps for yourself. Um, we went over this on Thursday, but here on the right-hand side, we've got the Mount Hood National Forest map, which is one that we often use, and also a district map here. Uh, this one's for the Barlow district. Uh, both of these you can probably fine for under 10 bucks um, and, and they're really helpful. And um, yeah, just a review again on districts, what I mean by that. So again, um, there are four districts in Mount Hood National Forest. Each of these kind of has different staff and budget priorities and whatnot. And um, I think of them almost kind of like counties within a state. And um, so that's that's going to be important to know when you're filling out your data sheet uh, what what district you're in, um, and also if you're in contact with with Forest Service staff about the things that you're finding, it'll be important to know what district you're in because there's different different timber sale planners and specialists that work in each part of the forest. And again, um, we talked a bit about this last time, but we use these uh, what we call unit maps. So these show uh, through these polygons kind of where the logging is proposed in relation to um, things like the, the forest road system. And sometimes it, they also show, you know, what type of logging is proposed or what the type of stand type is um, in terms of, you know, if it's previously logged or not. And these are all things that we're going to talk about here shortly in terms of how to Kind of to do some of these things on your own as well through being out on the ground. But we do um, also use an app called Avenza Maps. And so this is really handy. It allows folks to be able to track their path within the unit, um, to be able to tell whether you're inside of a proposed timber cell unit or outside of it. And sometimes it can be kind of hard to tell. And they don't mark them out on the ground very much anymore in the early phases of of when these projects are being planned. They actually used to, um, but they've kind of started to move away from that a little bit. So this, this is a really helpful tool that um, we encourage folks to download. And we have a tutorial, I believe, on this on our, on our website that we can share. And um, folks are definitely going to be able to get some good practice with this together in the field. Um, 
And then again, this is our ground truthing forum. There's a lot going on here and we're gonna go through all of this today. And uh, so this is what folks are gonna be filling out when they're, when they're out in the forest for, for each timber sale unit. And uh, like Misha shared last time, you know, some of this is gonna be stuff that you're filling out kind of as you go. And some of it is kind of big picture stuff that once you've walked through your entire unit, uh, you'll be able to answer some of these questions. You are gonna be walking off trail likely through for the, the majority of the time that you're gonna be out ground truthing in these places. And so it's really good to take things slow and safe, of course, um, and to cover as much of the unit that you're looking at as you can, as, as is practical. And so at the very beginning, I really encourage folks to kind of plot a course, you know, think about what parts of the timber sale unit you want to get to, um, what route you want to take. And I always say it's, it's a really good idea to, to think about, like, if you were to get turned around somewhere in the unit, say you were over here in unit 200, you know, what, what direction would you need to go to get back to the road? Sometimes it's obvious based off of the topography that exists in the unit. But a uh, thing that I really encourage folks to do before they get in there is, is take your compass and line it up with the map and, you know, ask yourself that question. You know, if I got turned around, in this case, uh, you'd be able to just walk east in any, you know, from any point in this unit and you'll definitely hit the road at some point. And, you know, the good news for this part, but I guess less good news for the forest is that there's, in some parts of Mountain National Forest, the road system is so dense that it's, it really doesn't take too long uh, walking before you, you hit some kind of road somewhere. Mm. Um, so the next thing that you want to do when you get to a unit is that you want to think about how that unit fits in the bigger picture of the area that you're in because the impacts of logging don't stop at the unit boundary. Um, so you can look around where you're parked. You can also plan to go to the different edges of the unit to try and see what's there. We have some examples here of what you might find on the edges. So if you look over on the right map, like unit 18 and 24, those look like pretty similar forests. So that might be on the edge, we might call that a contiguous forest. Um, unit 16, you have that little patch on the upper corner. Yeah, that's probably a clear cut. Um, over on the other picture, we have this big line through the middle of the map. Um, looks like there's probably power lines. Um, so that could be something that you could notate. And then you got these like squiggly forested lines coming through here. Those are probably some streams. Yeah, so we have this section of the map um, for you to be able to draw and like notate what landscapes and features that you find um, both inside and outside the unit. Um, so through a combination of like drawing on this map, filling out the rest of the sheet and using Avenza for pins, um, and tracks and photos, you can give a really full picture of what you found. If you want, this is an, some examples of some maps that have been drawn. Um, and you can see that people are actually able to fit like a lot of information in here. Um, the arrows notate slope. Um, these little dotted lines are streams. So here we have somebody looking at the map. Um, this is kind of another example of a drawing someone did to notate what's happening in the area. And on the right, we have lots of pins throughout a unit. So when you use, yeah, all of these methods, you can communicate a lot about what you found. Okay, so one of the first sections on the ground truthing form is about geography and geology. Um, the very first thing that you usually do when you get to a unit is notate um, the elevation. You can find that in a Venza. So this middle picture is a um, screenshot of a Venza. And down in the like right hand corner, you can see altitude is what they call elevation. So you can open that up and find that really easily. Um, you can also look at a map of where you're at. Um, if the map is a topographic map, it will have these contour lines, which are the brown lines going through here. 
Um, and those contour lines show you the elevation of the area that you're in. So on the right, you see there's a, a line, a bold line that says 600. And everywhere along that line, it is 600 feet in elevation. Um, so we have some tools on the website, resources on the website, if you're not familiar with topographic maps um, to help you learn how to read maps. Um, and that's another thing that if you don't have experience doing, um, that's a really great thing to practice when we're out in the field. Um, and the next part that we can look at is dominant aspect. Um, so the aspect of a slope is basically which direction, north, east, south and west that faces. So if you're standing on a slope and you're looking downhill, whichever direction you're facing is the aspect of that slope. Um, so dominant aspect is one of the things we ask to note. And sometimes that can be multiple aspects. Sometimes you're on a ridge. Um, or you can also just think about what's the most general direction this whole unit is facing. Watershed boundaries. Yeah, like where is this? slope, where is the water going to run into? Microclimate, species, sun and shade, local microclimate, yeah. So especially if it's a northern aspect or a southern aspect, you're going to get a lot of different um, levels of sun and the way that that area might respond to logging could be really different um, when they're on different aspects. All right, um, we can go to the next. Okay, um, so the next part of this sheet is the soil conditions. Um, we have a couple boxes for you to check off here. So the main two things, is it mostly dry? Is it mostly wet? Um, you can see up in the top, we have really dry soil. Down below, it's a wet soil. Um, once you get an idea of like plant indications, this is going to give you um, a really good idea of being able to tell this, but by writing down um, everything else that we have on the sheet, we'll also get an idea of what the soil is like. So you don't have to worry too much about being really accurate with this if you're not familiar with soils. Um, another part is the rockiness. So you can see uh, up in the top soil, there's like these big rocks there. Um, in the middle, you have a bunch of rocks throughout the soil. Um, the duff layer is basically when the soil is more wet and it takes longer for the needles and the leaves and the trees to decompose, um, there'll be like a middle, uh, a really like dark uh, topsoil. Um, and that's like the duff layer, that's what that's called. And then we have this other section. Um, a lot of times people write things like ashy um, or silty in here. If you have familiarity with um, learning to determine soil texture. texture. Um, so over here on the right, we have a diagram that is shows you the percentage of clay, silt, and sand, and all the different types of soil texture, texture that can happen with those different combinations of textures. Um, that's something that you can also write in the other section. Um, that's not something that we're teaching today or that we expect you to know, but that is one of the things that you can learn to do and write. All right, um, next section is other characteristics. Um, so one of the examples is rock outcroppings. That's just like some big boulders that you'll find outcropped. Um, on the right, we have a sign of land, landslides. Um, this is like the beginning of that landslide where it broke off. Um, on the left, excuse me, yeah, on the right is this tree. You can see it's like curving at the base. That's called pistol budding. Um, and if you find a slope that has a lot of trees that are doing this, um, it's an indication that that slope is like slowly moving um, downhill. And that's how the trees are accommodating for that movement. Um, so that's a sign of instability. Um, and if we found that, um, and they log that slope that could exacerbate that instability. Um, so similarly, if you find signs of landslides, um, logging could also exacerbate that. All right, and then the last part of this section is measuring slope. Um, the reason why we care about slope is that the like 
a higher slope that's going to be the more erosion that could be there. Um, also, when there's steeper slopes, they have to use different types of methods of logging. Um, we measure slope with, uh, oh, this green screen is not going to show this item. Let's put it in front of my face. Um, this is called a clinometer or an inclinometer. So like inclinometer. The way that we measure slope, um, and this is another thing that's going to be really great and easier to remember when you're actually out in the field doing it. Um, so this is just a little introduction to give you an idea of how we use this. Um, but basically you'll have a partner and I'll look at my partner and see where my eyes line up on them. So if we're exactly the same height, it might be eye level. If I'm a little bit shorter, it might be their chin, a little bit taller, it might be their head. Um, and we will separate out on the slope. Um, about 30 feet and I will use this to like spot them with one eye and look through this clinometer. Um, and when you look through it down in the right hand corner of the screen is what it looks like when you look through this. And as I go up and down, um, the numbers change with the basically what slope I'm pointing at. So I will look at my partner um, line up that little line with wherever we decided um, was in line with them, and I'll be able to read the slope. Um, and this also has percentage and degrees on either side, and we use percentage when we're measuring slope out in the field. All right. Well, thanks for that first part, Misha. So moving on to the next part of our data sheet, um, you know, we're thinking about some of the, the big picture questions now. So, you know, what's what's the, the history of the stand of trees that we're that we're in that we're trying to document? Um, you know, what's um, you know has it been logged before? Does it um, not have any history of logging? Is there any indication of maybe how old it is? So we're going to look at a few examples now, um, which all kind of have some clues that are pretty common that we use to determine uh, the answers to some of these questions. Um, starting out with this, this photo of this stand here, this is actually a, a multi-aged stand. So there, from this image, don't appear to be any signs of former logging, you know, in terms of stumps or, you know, old road cuts or, you know, an even age tree composition. There's some really nice big old Douglas firs in here, as well as some, some mature trees, some standing dead trees or snags, some down wood here as well. So this is, this is a really nice um, mature to, depending on you know, your forest type old growth stand here. So here's a couple of stand types back to back um, that in my experience, people oftentimes group these together uh, a little bit in their minds, or at least the Forest Service oftentimes kind of groups them together in, in how they're some, sometimes symbolized on maps. So on the left here is a, it's a recently burned stand. I think this photo was taken maybe a couple of years after this, this stand burned. Um, but, you know, there's a overstory of both dead and live trees here that you can tell, you know, experienced a fire with an understory that's coming up um, underneath them uh, pretty soon after. And that's in contrast to this stand here on the right-hand side, which is a young plantation that resulted from an almost complete clear cut of this stand probably, you know, 10 or so years back, depending on, um, you know, the elevation and soil type and stuff, those things can kind of determine how quick these things sprout back up. You can see that there's one big overstory tree that's visible here that they probably left behind as, as either a seed tree or, or for some other reason. Um, but, you know, this is a, all, all young conifers planted really close together is, is pretty characteristic of a, a previous clear cut that was replanted and is now um, a quote unquote plantation as is often symbolized on Forest Service maps. And so going through time a little bit, this is what some of these plantations look like a few decades later. So again, these areas were mostly clear cut probably, you know, 30 to 50 years ago. 
and then replanted oftentimes with a single species. Um, on the west side, it's mostly gonna be Douglas fir. And so you can see these are, are pretty, you know, evenly spaced. The look is really even aged. Um, you know, there's there's a real lack of, of large trees and snags and, and down wood, like we saw in that first slide. And oftentimes, especially when they're younger, there's there's a real lack of understory. And that's just because, you know, the uh, the stand is at a stage where where the canopy is is really closing in and excluding any other uh, tree saplings or understory plants from from really taking hold there in the understory. Um, so sometimes you'll also see signs of other signs of logging, um, like stumps. You can kind of see one here hiding behind the small tree. This stump here is actually an interesting example of something that we see a lot where uh, this actually has a, a springboard notch uh, cut into it that uh, this is actually from logging that occurred probably a hundred years ago or more. And this is uh, from when loggers, they inserted these, what they called springboards, uh, you can see in these images here. And that's so they can stand on those and, and basically get above the, the buttress of the tree in order to, to cut it down. So when you see stuff like that, that's a pretty good indication that the area was originally logged a really long time ago, you know, before some of the, the um, you know, automated and more machine-based tools that are common in the timber industry now were, were widely used. So this is a image here of a plantation that's getting a little bit older. So you can see kind of the differences here. Um, the stand's starting to, to self thin a little bit, you know, just due to the trees competing with one another for, for sunlight and for water and other resources. And that's resulting um, in more, more sunlight coming through the canopy. There's more of an understory. Things look more green here on the ground. There's, you know, there's some conifers that are started to grow up in the understory to form kind of, kind of a midstory and, and, you know, a second layer of conifers here. This is a, a previously thinned stand. Um, so there's, I should have actually put in more examples of this, but uh, you can see there's some overstory trees here that, you know, look like mature trees with some scattered stumps around. And then a pretty even age, you know, second cohort of trees that are coming up in the understory right here. And so, you know, just because you see big overstory trees, it doesn't necessarily mean that the area was never logged. So, you know, taking, taking note of some of these other um, structural criteria is a really important thing to do as well. And then this is an old growth stand. Um, kind of a lot going on here, but you know, there's this little acronym that I learned a long time ago that spells owls. And so I put that up here. And so basically the things that you're looking for, if you're wondering, is this an, an old growth stand? This was a, this acronym was mostly, I believe intended for, for moist west side cascade forest ecosystems. But in a lot of ways it, it can be applied pretty universally. Um, if you look around and there's big old trees, like you can kind of see one, a big old duck fir or two back here. Downed wood, so, you know, big down woody debris. Multi-layered, so, you know, not, not single-aged, like, like some of those plantations that you can actually see, you know, different ages of trees creating different layers throughout the canopy. And then standing dead trees or snags, which it looks like this one right here is one of those. So those that's just a, a fun little acronym to, uh, to kind of keep in your head. And it kind of relates to one of the reasons why noting these types of stands within timber sale units is really important because there are species like um, threatened northern spotted owls, for example, that really depend on, on large tracts of this kind of forest type for their survival. And um, it's, um, you know, you you might find, like we talked about in the first part of this training on Thursday, 
areas where the Forest Service has delineated an area and called it a plantation, but there might be pockets of forest within that that, that might look like this. And so those are really important places to note. And actually, I think it was the first timber sale that I ever ground truthed. It was called the Wildcat Timber Sale, where that exact thing happened. And we were actually able to go out to some of the units with the Forest Service and show them that there was some old growth within some of the stands they called plantations. And after seeing that, they you know immediately dropped those parts of the timber sale from uh, from those units. And, you know, to me, that was a, that was a really impactful experience that, that spoke to, you know, the, the effect that some of this work can have. So I think, oh yeah, we've got a couple examples here. I wanted to see, so we've looked, we've looked at a few examples already. And I was wondering, based off of a few images here, what would folks call a stand like this? based off of what you can see. And you've got your key here on the left. Um, if folks wanna just throw in the chat how you might wanna characterize this. There's a question, isn't this an east side cascade forest though? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes yeah, it that's, is. That's one of the tricky things. And so we've got previous thin, plantation, plantation, okay. A lot of previous thins are plantations. For those of you that said that, what are some of the clues that you see? Ethan Age, that's a good clue. Yeah, so let's see, one of these first comments up here that, you know, you mentioned that this is more of an east side stand. So that's a, that's a really important clue right there that we didn't talk about yet, but so when you're dealing with environments that are more arid and you know if we got a closer look at the soil we'd be able to see it was really dry really rocky so naturally the forest isn't going to come back quite as dense in some of these places and there also might be more of an influence of of fire that that clears out some of the understory in these places and so I guess this is kind of a trick question because, you know, we can't, the people that said previously thinned, um, you know, one of the main clues there is like, do you see stumps around? Like you do see a lot of spacing. So you, you might think that, um, but it's really important to remember that when you're making this call, you want to, you want to make sure you see a good amount of the stand and be looking for, for multiple clues here before you make that determination. And so I believe that this area actually had been previously thinned and burned. Um, although if I were out to only see this photo, I don't know if I'd be able to actually make that call. But those of you that did, um, great job. Yeah, we got a question here. Couldn't single age also be response to natural forces? Yep, definitely. So there's um, in forest ecology, if there's a, a, what's called a stand replacing fire or you know a wind a wind throw event or a landslide that can definitely also promote these um, these single aged uh, stand conditions to emerge usually with those there's going to be some type of what's called legacy features that are kind of left over from before that happened so you know big old snags um, but you know, in the case of this, on the east side, and especially in higher elevations and you know harsh conditions, you might not actually see a lot of trees that are maybe what you're used to in terms of size in a really old stand. They're just not going to grow to that size. And so um, these are the types of things that it takes a little bit of time to kind of hone in on some of the patterns, but. I, I guarantee once you come out with us to a few different types of forests and timber sales, you'll be able to kind of start making these connections in your head. Okay. Hey, so Michael. Yep. I'm just going to jump in. Uh, I, this is, this was a good trick question. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I definitely noticed that there were no stumps. It was hard for me to see them. I see off to the left and just between that, the little table, and this large tree that's mostly in the foreground, that looked like maybe a stump or something that 
could be from a fire. This area definitely looks like it's been, it's it's gone through some fire event. Uh, but that, and, and then like the uniformity of age for um, all of these pine trees caused me to think that this had definitely been thinned. Um, and the lack of any kind of large tree, you, because from what I've seen in, in areas that undergo fire, there's at least, you know, a handful of large trees that make it through the fire. Uh, so mm -hmm. it was tricky. I think I, I can see, I can see why you ended up thinking both a fire event and thinning. And I'm just um, curious, like what it looks like around there, if there's more stumps in the area from, mm -hmm. from previous thinnings. And that because this is a, just the type of forest it is, the density is not one that would lend itself to seeing you, where you would see a lot of stumps. Right. So yeah, this was this was a re this is from uh, the South Penn project that Misha and I went to uh, back in the fall, I think. And so it was really tricky. There was some places where there were stumps that were visible, but there were a lot of places that weren't. And I think that it was, and there were also places where it was, you know, it really varied in the spacing. Some places were really naturally wide open. Some places had bigger trees. And so the answer to the question was not consistent throughout even a single unit. And that is the hardest, <laughs> the hardest um, example right there when you're seeing all these different things kind of present themselves within the same timber sale unit. So that, um, that's a good example of why it's so important to, to really course, you know, plot out your course and try to cover as much of the unit that you can because there, there could be a number of pockets that, that show up differently uh, from each mm -hmm. other. And take lots of photos because, you know, a lot, a lot of images showing the different kind of stand types that present themselves within the unit that you're in, those, those can really, uh, they can really speak volumes. But, you know, so I would say this area, I'm sure that it had experienced stand replacing fires in the past, um, not in the recent past. My, my understanding was that it had been thinned a number of times throughout the past, you know, 100 years or so since it had been managed by the Forest Service and that there had also been some fires that went through. And some of that management that had happened had removed some of the larger trees. Um, and uh, so kind of a complicated history. But I'm gonna do one more example here. So this is a, uh, kind of a more, more of a transition forest type between east and west side. So you can see a big ponderosa pine right here and a big Douglas fir. So yeah, what do folks think about this one? That result of fire suppression. Hmm. Can you say, yeah, say, say more about more that? More about that. If you, if you feel okay about it. Yeah, well, it looks like obviously there's some old growth in here. So I would say, like, definitely either never logged or previously thinned a long time ago. But like, I know ponderosa pine relies on a lot of low level, like, fires to clear undergrowth. And there's a lot of like smaller um, mm -hmm. uh, conifers in here of differing species. So I guess that's kind of confusing me because those clearly haven't been thinned in a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It looks like some of these smaller conifers in here, they might be more of a, the shade tolerant variety, which, you know, in an ecosystem where ponderosa pine and in many cases also dug fir are kind of the overstory tree, their fire regimes are much more frequent than what we would expect on the west side. And so, you know, conditions like this where the forest floor um, doesn't have a whole lot of new growth on it is pretty common. This also looks like there's a pretty thick layer of, of duff and pine needles here. 
that are surrounding this big old tree, which that also sometimes can be a sign of, of fire suppression. Since, you know, oftentimes both the understory and that duff layer is, are the main things that get worked through by the fire. Um, we've got another person here saying thin. I imagine because there's at least kind of in the, um, you know, in the foreground, there's some, there's some pretty wide spacing here. So I guess, you know, this is kind of a, a little bit of another trick question. I think that, um, you know, that, that first comment about it being a result of fire suppression, you know, if I, if I had to make the call here, I would say that this was, you know, a, a forest ecosystem that had, you know, a history of fire, more frequent fire in the past, that there's kind of a, a suite of um, shade tolerant species that are coming up in the understory. Um, so, you know, that question of like what, what that fire regime was in the past is definitely a good one. Um, again, we're not seeing any stumps necessarily, but I think it is really, um, one of the reasons I put this up here is because just because you see those big old trees, it doesn't mean that it has been never logged. There could be some thinning that has happened in the past and, and the area could have been really heavily logged in the past um, with only a few of these big old growth remnant trees left behind. And so does never log always mean old growth? So yeah, that kind of relates to that in which, um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that there's, there could be, for example, a, a stand replacing fire that um, that came through the area and the and the forest naturally regenerated, but doesn't really have kind of that old growth structure that we talked about in terms of you know the the forest in the stages that it goes through doesn't really need to um, or doesn't hasn't really had the chance to be able to develop those multiple layers and and woody debris and whatnot. So hopefully that answers that question. And so if not managed somehow, where are the down wood and snags? So that's a great question. And that's, so see, that's something that I think folks should always be thinking of when they're walking through the units. Like if you don't see those down wood and snags, that is a very clear indication that there's been some management there in the past. Um, especially because, you know, historically, when, even when areas were thinned, those, those snags came down because it was the easiest way to, you know, address any safety concerns um, or, you know, in places where they thinned and then replanted a second cohort, cohort of species, those snags, you know, they got in the way sometimes. So that's, that's a really good clue to hone in on. Um, but it's also a, a good reminder to, uh, you know, move around the unit and, and see what's around there before you start to, to really try to answer these bigger picture picture questions because just because there's no snags in this this one spot doesn't necessarily mean that they don't exist in other parts of the unit. So so Ryan, you got something? Yeah, I just had a question. You're talking about the wildcat sale and y'all went in and found some patches of old growth that weren't represented on the maps. Um, and they they took those out of the sale. Is it the case that like, if y'all hadn't done that, does the logging company just come in and say like, oh, this wasn't on the map, so like free score and they just log it out. And then the forest service is not like monitoring what they're taking off the land. You know, like, how does that? I guess the answer to that is it depends, but we, you know, you never really know unless you get out there and, and bring attention to those areas. So, you know, of course there's, there's maybe a chance that at some point the timber cruisers or the you know forest service staff that are kind of administering that sale might have gone out there and looked at the timber sale boundaries and noticed that there is this different forest type in there but i wouldn't necessarily count on that because i've definitely seen cases where you know there's you know a riparian area or something like that which we'll talk about later that's within the timber sale boundary that isn't mapped and you know, you could assume that that area would be left out when when the actual 
the boundaries are being laid out on the ground, but it, it isn't always. And so I think in a best case scenario, the answer would be that they would leave those places out. But again, you never, you never really do know unless you get out there on your own and, and draw attention to the area. And, and, you know, what Bark has started to do is request follow up in terms of, you know, seeing the contract maps and language that really specifically calls out those areas being being left out of the timber sale because if not there's really no way that we could possibly know until after the fact of course so hopefully that answers your question all right so i think misha is gonna talk a little bit about trees and tree measuring now um so when we're out in the forest we measure a lot of tree diameters um, on the right, there's like a little circle and that it represents a trunk, um, the green line around it. So in case you don't know what diameter and circumference is, the green line going all around that circumference and the purple line going through it is the diameter. Um, does anyone know what information we might get from measuring a tree's diameter? Like why this might be significant. Diane says age. Yeah, that's that's it. Um, so the diameter doesn't give us an exact age, but it does give us like a rough estimate. Um, it gives us an idea of how old the trees are and how old the stand is. Um, we use a forester's diameter tape, um, which basically instead it goes around the circumference, but the inches are like spread out. So when you look at it, it actually just measures the diameter. Um, and you can see a bunch of people measuring diameter here. Um, when we measure diameter, the one really important thing is to make sure that you are going above where the tree buttresses. So the tree like will start wide and get skinnier and you wanna be above that like really wide part near the ground. Um, different species of trees do that more than others so too. Okay, so up in the corner here, this is uh, the part of the ground tree thing um, form that shows trees and diameters. So we measure the typical overstory, typical understory, and then we always measure like the biggest trees too. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the different species that we find uh, up here. Yes, okay. So does anybody know um, who this tree is. And if you do, uh, like what is telling you what species this tree is? Courtney says Doug fir, Doug fir. Yeah, so how do y'all know it's Doug fir? Mouse tail on the cone. Yeah, so yeah, so this mouse tail on the cone. So basically on this cone, you see these little like three pronged things sticking out. Those are called bracts. Um, and there's a little story, I think like the mouse I don't know the story, but the mouse, I think, runs up the tree because it's like escaping a fire. And so those three little bracts are supposed to be like the two legs and the tail sticking out. So people call it mouse tails. Um, another person says bottle brush looking needles. Yeah, so the needles are like really soft and they go all around um, the twigs. So like if you run, it's like your hands across it. It's like a bottle brush. Um, anything else telling you that this is Doug Fur? Dark brown, deeply fissured bark. Yes. Yeah. So up in the right hand corner, there's like this uh, picture. It's really small of the deep bark fissures. Um, that's another really obvious characteristic of old growth dug firs. Dug firs are often um, one of the first uh, dominant like overstory species. They grow really quick and tall when they're young. Um, so you'll find a lot of dug firs in the west side forests. Go to the next slide. Okay, does anybody know who this is? And how do you know who it is? Hemlock, tiny cones. Hemlock, 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 yep. Um, these itty bitty cones, I really like that this picture has the finger next to the cones because you can tell how little the cones are. Um, tiny needles, yeah. Um, so when you see hemlocks around or you're around hemlocks, you'll see tons of these itty bitty cones on the ground. Um, the other really obvious thing about hemlocks is that their needles are two different sizes. So you can see the tiny ones and the like a little bit longer ones. Um, yep. And then the last really 
obvious identifier is that at the top, um, a lot of trees will have like a straight top leader is what it's called, but hemlocks droop. So hemlocks are really great at hanging out at the forest floor and being little saplings waiting for opportunities for sun um, to come around so they can grow taller. So they're really shade tolerant. Um, and you'll find a lot of these as like the understory trees under Doug, forest, uh, Doug fir forests. Uh, I've got yeah. a, a question or, or a comment, mm -hmm. just something that I've noticed on, on my hikes is that hemlocks appear to be really opportunistic, meaning that they, I see them growing on dead trees, decaying trees and stumps a lot of times. Like that's, that's the first and most dominant thing that's growing on, on a stump. And I was curious about that. Yeah, um, yeah, we're gonna show some hemlocks growing on a stump a little bit later. Because <laughs> um, hemlocks are really good. <laughs> oh no, that's that's great. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think hemlocks do really well. With, they need like a lot of nitrogen, which the stumps provide, and they also um, like when they grow. So since they can grow on the like down log so well, it gives them like a little advantage uh, over like the understory um, for being able to be that like next species that's going to grow high. Um, but yeah, that's, that's yeah, I was, say. I was gonna say the thing about the, that they're a really nitrogen dependent species. Mm. And some of, some of the other common plants that you'll see growing on logs, like, you know, red huckleberries and, and, you know, sometimes trillium and and other species, those are those are also really nitrogen dependent. Whereas, you know, Doug fir, you'll see Doug fir. I can't go back for some reason, but um, that that's a species that you do not see growing on logs very much, and that's because they really require bare mineral soil to get established in, and you know, a ton of sunlight too. Which is why, you know, back in the day when foresters would would clear cut a stand, they would then burn it afterwards and sometimes work the soil a little bit before they would replant the Douglas fir because that, that's what would really promote it. Um, so sometimes when they didn't do that, um, and we'll probably see examples of this, after a clear cut happens, you'll see a lot more hemlocks um, than Douglas firs just because so much of that large woody debris was left behind that it kind of inhibited Doug first from really becoming the more dominant overstory. But so it's just a fun, fun little forensic thing that you can do by looking at the dominant tree species. Yeah, um, there's a question about differentiating between Western and mountain hemlock. Um, there is actually like a whole ecology club on that goes into a lot more detail on these different tree species. Um, but mountain hemlock will be higher elevation and it has more of like a star-like spirally needles and bigger cones than the Western hemlock. Um, all right, does anybody know what tree this is? Red cedar, how do you know? Scales instead of needles, cluster cones. Yeah, so the scaly needles that are flat segments um, or like scaly leaves are really uh, evident of Western red cedars. You really don't see that in other trees around here. Um, yeah, the bark is also a telltale sign. Um, it's fibrous, really stringy and like long stringing up the bark. Um, you'll also see these in wet areas. Um, so if you see Western red cedar, that's like a key to you that maybe there's some water in that area or more wet than other parts of the unit that you're looking at. Okay, so next part that we're going to talk about is measuring canopy closure. Um, measuring the canopy closure, uh, well, I guess canopy closure is how much foliage um, relative to the sky is, or how much foliage is covering like your view of the sky. Um, this is important because the agency makes um, claims about the current canopy closure and compared with what they want it to be. Um, and many species depend on like a uh, closed canopy. Uh, we measure canopy closure uh, using binoculars. So you can see the person in the middle has binoculars flipped upside down and that gives you like a wider view of the sky. Um, so the diagram down on the left hand corner um, 
is kind of giving you an idea of what you're seeing when you look up at the canopy like that. Yeah, so these are all estimates. Um, you're not going to get like a really exact reading with the canopy closure. Um, just do the best that you can. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is snags and down trees. Um, snags, and are, which are standing dead trees, are really important for wildlife. Um, wildlife tend to depend on dead trees even more than living ones. Um, and large snags are especially important for wildlife habitat. Uh, snags often come down with thinning because if you're cutting trees around a snag, the snag is a safety hazard. Um, so the forest has standards and guidelines for how many snags need to be left per acre. Um, so when we go out and find an area with like a lot of high quality snags, we can make the case to like buffer those snags. Um, on the right here, this is kind of like the death cycle of a tree. So you can see how many different species depend on the different stages of a tree's uh, death and decomposition. And this is a wonderful diagram showing all the different animals and species that help um, the process of decomposition and that uh, depend on these dead and dying trees too. All right, um, another section we talk about is downed wood. Um, so downed wood is really important because wildlife also use it. Um, it acts as soil stabilization, it retains moisture, and it's site for it, they are sites for nitrogen fixation. Um, so like we talked about, the hemlocks, which are really nitrogen dependent trees, um, really love these nursing logs. Um, yes, I think we talked, yeah. So this is an example, I think it's, may be supposed to be the exact same uh, tree that or log that we just saw, um, but you can see how the hemlock roots go down the stump to the ground um, and eventually this downed log will be like decomposed into the ground and you'll just see like a big line of hemlocks there where it once was. Well, cool. and this is the section of the form that talks about down trees and snags. So we asked the same questions for both of them. Um, first is about density. Are there a lot of them, like some of them or almost none of them basically. Um, size, 20 inches in diameter is kind of an arbitrary um, number that we picked, but it just is an idea so that you have something that you know, bigger than 20 is relatively large, smaller than 20 is what we would consider snag or small um, or a mix of sizes. And then the last is the age, is it decayed, is it fresh, is there a good mix of decayed and fresh? Cool. Any questions on the tree section? Oh, DBH, that's diameter at breast height. Yeah, um, so I think I didn't mention this, but this is something that you'll definitely be shown out in the field. Um, when you're measuring diameter, the standard is to measure it at breast height. Um, it's like approximately four feet above the ground and usually gets above the buttress. Sometimes a little bit higher when, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. when the buttress is high like that. But. Yeah, or well, you also go on the uphill side of the tree. So it, you, know, you want to wrap it around at the same level. So when you're on the downhill side of the tree, it will be a lot higher than breast height. Um, but yeah, that's a notation on all of those. It says DBH a bunch of times, and that's just diameter at breast height. I'll also add the, the 20 inches thing for the for this part. Um, one, it is kind of an arbitrary number, but it's also a number that a lot of people who have studied wildlife use of, of dead trees and forest have kind of noted that 20 inches and up is, is really when these trees start to become more utilized and more valuable by, by wildlife in the forest. Um, and that's for a lot of different reasons, just, you know, relating to space, but also relating to, you know, how long the trees will stay standing if they're a snag. If they're bigger, they're going to stay standing longer. Um, they're going to decompose slower. Um, they'll be on the landscape for longer. So just, I guess, a little bit more context there, too. And the forester's tape does give diameter. Yeah, got, got a magic tape that makes the conversion really easy. So we're measuring circumference, but the tape gives us diameter. So that's really nice. So. 
I talked a little bit about riparian areas earlier. Um, riparian basically means wet areas. So, you know, streams, wetlands, seeps, rivers, lakes, all that is kind of under the umbrella of riparian um, for the purposes of our, our data sheet here. Um, if you come out with us and do wetland surveys, that gets much more broken out um, and it's kind of a whole different story. But for this, riparian is a wet area. Um, it's really important to document these because very often the, uh, the riparian areas aren't fully mapped um, within the timber sale unit boundaries. And so that means that they might not be properly buffered either. And it's especially important to note um, if the stream is perennial, meaning uh, permanent, year-round, or intermittent, which means for the most part seasonal, so it doesn't flow year-round. And there's kind of a lot of clues that indicate whether it's intermittent or perennial. You can usually tell by, you know, things like the size of the stream, um, or the type of uh, what's called the substrate or the, the bottom of the stream. So, you know, for example, perennial streams often have more cobble or bedrock at the bottom. Um, there's there's kind of a lot of these clues that, that I think folks will be able to start to hone in on. And it's, it's also, you know, if it's an intermittent stream, obviously late in the summer, it's going to probably be dry. And that's actually one of the reasons that a lot of these get um, remain unmapped because the Forest Service, kind of like we talked about in the first training, they have a whole lot of ground to cover within a short amount of time. And so oftentimes these things get missed when they're out there later in the season. Um, and it's also totally fine when you're doing this to note that you're not really quite sure if it's intermittent or perennial. Uh, we just ask that, that folks do their best. Because the intermittent stream, whether it's an intermittent or a perennial, that's going to affect the, the size of um, the no cut buffer that gets placed on these streams. There's other things that factor into this too, which relate to you know the slope that's near the stream or the distance from uh, a stream that might have endangered salmon, for example, in it. But uh, intermittent versus perennial is, is definitely a big piece of that. And so, you know, along with that, um, we definitely wanna be encouraging folks to take some notes on what these streams look like in terms of the structure. So like we talked about a little bit in that first training, oftentimes the Forest Service makes statements about the conditions of the riparian areas, you know, that they're lacking wood. So, you know, it is true that uh, across the forested landscape, especially on managed forests, there's a real, um, I think it's called like, there are streams that are structurally starved, meaning that for whatever reason, they don't contain the kind of structural diversity that that uh, a lot of aquatic species depend on, mostly things like um, like wood in a stream. So, uh, like you can see, there's some there's some logs here that have started to fall into the stream channel. So, taking notes and, and photos um, to give an indication of what the structure looks like, and then also, you know, so if it's a a really incised or steep stream channel. You know, something something about kind of how that stream is placed on the landscape is going to be really helpful for us. Some other examples of riparian areas or things that you might see um, during the season where maybe the water itself isn't visible are some indicator plants. And so for places like seeps or boggy patches in the forest, um, those are also really important for aquatic organisms. And, and those are, are rarely properly mapped. And um, this is a really good indicator plant here. Um, actually, yeah, does anyone know this plant? Just throw that in the chat really quick. It's a fun one. I get excited about finding it. Let's see, dandelion, not quite. I could see why you would think that though. It's not the best photo, but yes, yeah, skunk cabbage. Um, yeah, so got these like really huge 
uh, yellow flowers here that um, I wish we, maybe we get, a, I think we get another close up of that later on. But yeah, these really huge, like prehistoric looking leaves here. That's, those are probably the best indicators, especially on the west side of the Cascades, <clears throat> that you've got a really high water table and, and a seep groundwater kind of coming up from the ground in that place. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about roads. Um, we touched on this in the first part, but you know, the roads and the road access is gonna be really important to document when you're out. And you know, again, remembering to include this entire seven digit number right here that we talked about uh, to reduce the amount of confusion that we get from looking at these data sheets. And so, um, you know, again, like we talked about last time, there, there are these three different kinds of roads that you'll see on the recreation maps and, and then on signs out in the forest. And so, again, these two digit roads, the arterial roads, those are the most used roads, main routes, you know, like Highway 26, 46, 35. Uh, those are usually paved, you know, high use. These four digit collector routes kind of, um, there's a couple extra digits that get added on when they sort of work outward from these main routes. So those are the collector routes. So sometimes those are paved, sometimes not. They still get a good amount of use. Um, and then there's these three digit spur roads that are um, off of those. Those usually aren't paved. They're usually not very well maintained. Um, sometimes they can be pretty overgrown. So it's important to, you know, when you're writing down the roads that are, are out surrounding your unit, just make sure that you, you use all seven uh, digits, like is kind of outlined here, just so we know where you were exactly. And we'll get more practice with that. So along with um, noting what roads are there, we want to be paying attention to, you know, what's the hydrology, what's the surface condition of these roads? Is there erosion happening? You know, what's the drainage look like? So, you know, this, this route here, I think this was a collector road um, out in the Kalawash that it was built on top of a slump. So that's what's causing this crack is kind of a, it's another clue, kind of like the pistol budding trees that the slope that this is on is sort of slowly shifting downwards. And um, it probably was not a great place for this road to be built because of that. So that's that's gonna be an important thing to note there because we, we might be able to provide some recommendations about uh, this road or maybe other proposed roads in the area because of that clue. This road here looks like it was built through like a, a seep or a wet area. Obviously there's a lot of water accumulating here a um, lot of mud and sediment being generated. It's probably near a riparian area. So, you know, definitely taking photos and, and notes about situations like that. I think this road was, this was part of the North Clack timber sale project. And I think that's, this one is actually being decommissioned because it was impacting a nearby stream. So here's another example. So we've got a road, a spur road that's going over a creek, like a spring fed creek right here. And there's no culvert or really anything like that. It's just kind of going over the road and kind of, you know, slowly taking road fill and, and sediment with it back into the stream. So that's not an ideal situation. Same sort of thing going on here. So we've got a stream that um, instead of crossing the road is, is kind of using the road as an extension of its length and then connecting with another road down here and probably dumping road fill and sediment down into a culvert and into a stream somewhere where, it, where it's eventually terminating. So lots, lots of road issues can be found out there. Um, here's, here's another example. It looks like there was probably a big rain or storm event where a culvert up here was, or maybe the ditch that led to the culvert was blocked. And so it took all of this road fill down to the other side and and you know is impacting this culvert here and, and kind of slowly eroding this roadbed. Another example here of it looks like this culvert was too small, maybe it got blocked, and so the water just kind of moved through the uh, um, the road fill and and caused this big landslide and part of the road to deteriorate around this culvert. 
just some examples of <laughs> extreme examples of things you might see. Obviously, this is pretty extreme. This was a, a road that um, started to gully from water continuously rushing down it and really caused a very deep um, incision here in the road that made it totally impassable and completely washed it out. So in addition to those things, you wanna be paying attention to, is the road open um, effectively? Is it closed on either on purpose or just naturally, you know, passively closed through becoming overgrown and unused over time or trees falling down across it? So these images show what's called a berm. Uh, and this is a really common technique that um, contractors for the Forest Service use when they close roads. Basically, you know, taking a backhoe <coughs> and digging out the road fill, kind of like where this person is standing and bringing it up and creating this big earthen mound, which blocks access to the road. Um, that's, that's one technique. You might also see boulders or, you know, root wads or gates. And this is a road that was actually recently uh, rehabilitated or decommissioned. Um, I should have put more examples of this up there too, but you can see this road got really roughed up by a backhoe here to intentionally decompact the road surface. And, and that's so, you know, the rain can percolate down into the soil more easily. So the road doesn't wash out over time. And, you know, it, it gives a good, a good substrate for, for, this area to be revegetated and also, you know, prevents access for, you know, in the case, for example, where a berm might have been pushed in or circumvented, there isn't the road surface right beyond it where people can keep driving. Like what happened here where it looks like slowly half of this berm got pushed into to the um, ditch that was created behind it and is now effectively being used as an open road. And so those are types of things that are important to document if you see them too. Um, you know, there's could be breached closures or circumvented closures. And, um, you know, roads that aren't on the map that may have been built, you know, user created, going into places they really shouldn't be going. And these are all, yeah, important things to document due to you know, their potential interaction with the logging that could occur there in the future. You know, the two could really exacerbate each other. And we've seen places where, you know, there's there's already a ton of kind of um, rogue road building that's occurring. And then when the logging comes in and, and creates additional landings and skid trails and opens things up, the problem just gets way worse. So documenting those things beforehand really allows us to be able to make recommendations to the Forest Service about, you know, addressing some of these issues uh, before they become worse. Okay, um, so now I guess another thing that's important to document is any wildlife sign that you see, whether that's um, actually sighting wildlife or sighting scats, tracks, calls, or burrows. Um, so we have a bunch of different examples here. Um, I'm just going to call out a picture and then if anybody wants to type in the chat or say what it is, please do. Um, okay, so what is on the left side next to this pencil? Scat. Yeah, who's, do you know who scat it is? It's rabbit scat um, or hare scat. So if you see little, little circular pellets like that, um, about that size, it's rabbit scat. There's other little pellets that can be different sizes. Um, how about on the right? You have these little burrows. Um, we also have all of these like plants at the top corner that have been drug around these burrows. Is there bigger holes though? Um, well, this is a sign of a mountain beaver. Um, mountain beavers tend to uh, build holes in like rocky wet slopes. A lot of the times outside of these holes you'll notice like fresh dirt that's been kicked outside of it um, and you'll also notice like little packets of plants being drug to the entrance of those holes. Okay. Does anybody know? These are both uh, signs for the same animal. Yeah, one guess for elk, bear, deer, 
Okay, so I guess on the right, yeah, these are deer pellets. Um, if they're bigger, sometimes they can look like elks. And then uh, this scratching on the tree um, is from an antler rubbing. The ways you can tell the difference between uh, it being a deer or other animals is like the height. Um, maybe there's like claws in the scratching, those sorts of things you can look for. All right, next. <laughs> okay, what is this? Yeah, bear. Okay, um, yeah, so over on the left in this log, we have a bear that's been digging into a down log. Um, they can like search for food that way. Um, in the middle, we have some bear scat. And on the right, we have bear prints. Um, bear prints are really big and can be pretty obvious when you find it. And sometimes scats can be like in a long log, but other times it's just kind of like a unshaped pile. Um, this is a pileated woodpecker. This is a really important species because um, it's the like, primary excavator of trees. They have the strongest bill and can uh, make holes that other animals will then like excavate more for dens. Um, the pileated woodpecker sign is can be really obvious because they have these like long, deep, rectangular holes in these trees. Um, so that's a way that you can tell that. Okay. Cool. And then these are some sensitive um, species or protected species. Um, the red tree vole. Um, we can't tell if there's a red tree vole from the ground, but one of the reasons that we look for like big dug firs and we look for some of the characteristics of the big dug firs is we can mark a tree that organization that we work with might climb the trees and look for red tree voles. Um, and then on the left is a cop copes giant salamander. Um, one thing that we say is whenever you're walking your streams, just like look in the stream and if you see an animal, take a picture of it. Um, Cause I don't personally have the skills to identify these animals and you may or may not, but we um, know people we can like send the pictures to, to help identify those animals. Cool. Um, next is the typical plant and fungi seen in the unit. Um, this can tell us a lot about what's happening in the area. Um, it can tell us about the soil. Um, it can tell us about the stage of uh, the forest, like what succession it's in. Um, yeah. And so an, a couple other things to notice or write down are any unusual, unrecognized or sensitive plants. Um, so if you aren't familiar with a plant, that's a good time to write it down. Make sure that you photograph it, mark it on the map, um, like on the drawn map, and also put it on a Venza. Um, we wanna really record those plants really well. Um, so these are examples. This on the left is isn't a rare plant, but it is an endemic clac or endemic to the clackmas. Um, this is a clackmas iris. And then on the right, this is a minimally protected lichen, Usnea longissima. Um, and this is something that was it was this found in zigzag, Michael, or was this found somewhere else? Yeah, we we find it a lot actually. Yeah, a lot of different projects. <laughs> Yeah, it's, they basically, um, we, we always mark where it is. It's usually the Forest Service protects the tree that it's on and any trees touching it. So it doesn't, it's not like the red tree bowl where we get like a big 10 acre buffer around it, but it can have, it can have an impact for sure. And it's really fun. <laughs> yeah, what's happening there? Uh, they are like stretching out the lichen because you can see like one of the ways like it's identified is that like it splits up into little segments instead of it breaking apart. Um, so you can kind of like barely see one of those threads breaking into segments. All right, these are some other um, plants and fungus that have been found, um, protected plants, fungus that have found recent timber sales. Um, yeah, Lady Slipper on the right, that was down in the crystal clear. And I'm not going to try to say uh, <laughs> the Latin names, Michael, if you want to go for that. That's uh, Albatrellus flatii, and it's the sometimes called, called the blue night mushroom. But, I, you know, the, the fungus folks, 
the common names really vary a whole lot more. So I think they they like to stick to Latin more. Same with the Lycan folks. I'm just going to say I know how to pronounce this word because of the the mushroom uh, ecology club that happens and the Ooh. song at the end. Like as soon as I saw the word, I thought of the oh, song yeah. and I know how to pronounce it. Well, <laughs> that's a fun way to remember some of these things. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. both of these, I think, were in the crystal clear timber sale. Um, and they're, they're survey and managed species under the Northwest Forest Plan, meaning that they are protected. So very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of volunteers working on some survey and manage resources, but if the if a plant has been found in a timber sale, there will be like resources for learning how to identify that and spot that in other units. Um, all right, on the left is a survey managed species, or it was recently a survey managed species. This is candy stripe. Um, and then on the right is a bigger picture of that protected lichen in the Usnea. Um, it's nice and long. This is another lichen on that was found on this tree um, that was protected. And I have the Latin name written down, but again, I'm not going to. So Michael, if you want to say that. Uh -huh. I know it's a pseudocephalaria, or I think people call it like the speckle belly. Oh, yes. Lichen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this was in the solo timber sale. And this was a, a time when there was a, a hike leader for Bark that was really good with lichens who was basically describing this lichen because at the time it was receiving a lot of protection. And the hike leader was like, yeah, it'd be really cool if it was around here. No one's seen it. Um, and then someone on the hike was like, is that it right there? <laughs> and uh, the hike leader was like, yeah. And then, you know, it's kind of one of those things where if you spot it once, then you kind of see it everywhere. And that's what ended up happening. And it was one of the reasons that this timber sale got eventually totally dropped. So a pretty big impact. Okay. Um, so these are some more common plants that you might see, especially on the west side. Um, we have salal. Um, this produces like lots of berries later after the flowers. Um, and ocean spray on the right. You know, ocean sprays uh, on the west side is associated with the drier areas. Um, all right. On the left, we have Oregon grape. Um, you see these big yellow flowers that are blooming about now in Portland and those turn to like blue berries later in the year. Um, on the right is rhododendron. These are also a little drier, but not as dry as the first two, um, but definitely like west side wet associated plants. Um, then we have sword fern in the corner. This is a fern that you're going to see a lot. Um, skunk cabbage, which Michael talked about earlier um, and devil's club. Uh, especially like devil's club and skunk cabbage are really associated with riparian areas. Um, I saw like a whole big stream with just like devil's clubs in it once like running stream in the middle of August. Um, so it can be in really very wet areas and do really well. And be careful of devil's club. Um, and then another thing that we want to notice are uh, in invasive or novel plants to an area, um, you know, whether you feel that they're good or bad or neutral, um, it is good to notice um, because they can spread into the unit after logging um, because a lot of them uh, do well on recently disturbed areas. Um, a lot of times we'll see this along the roads. So you can note this maybe if you're looking at a roadside and you notice that there's a lot of invasive or notable plants around there, that's a good place to write that. Um, this is scotch broom, like this yellow plant. And then I wasn't sure what this, I couldn't tell what plant this was, Michael, but like, okay. That's, uh, this is um, thistle. I oh, this I see, bull okay. Thistle. This one, oh, I wish, this is so bad, but this was a, this is oxide daisy. That's a really common one up on, on forest roads. Uh, it's really prevalent. So if you, maybe if you were driving, this is what you would see. <laughs> Not the best photo, but. 
Okay, and then the very last uh, section that we're going to talk about is recreation and timber sale markings. Um, cool. So, yeah, so this example, you might see trails. Um, they might be like well used trails that are established like this, um, or like we saw an unmarked mountain bike trail at one of our timber sales last year. So, you can note that too. Um, you know, they also, you might find like established campgrounds. Um, or a lot of times there's just gonna be like fire pits or obvious places where people have been target shooting. Um, it's good to know all of those uses. And then, um, yeah, very last section is the timber sale markings. So a lot of times you will see this survey tape um, around trees or on something on the ground or on a lot of times on plants. Um, and it's good to take a picture note on events of where that is, take a picture of the markings, um, go ahead and note that on the ground truthing sheet. And you can note too, if it's like, looks really old or if it looks new, a lot of times they'll actually like have a date on it. Um, in the middle, you see a blue boundary marker. Um, so this marks the boundaries of the units for the sale. Um, it's good, also take a picture of that, notice if it's old or new. Um, BART keeps a record of all of the past timber sales. So if there are markings for a past timber, timber sale, we can go back and look at what happened with that timber sale, um, get any evidence from that. Yeah, so that is about it for today. I just wanna, yeah, thank you everyone for coming to these presentations and um, let people know kind of what happens now. So. If you, if you aren't on it already, you're gonna be put on an email listserv that, um, so you can receive notifications of upcoming field days that we schedule throughout the spring, the summer and the fall. We sometimes go out in the winter too, but especially this last year with um, how COVID was, we didn't do a whole lot of that. Um, you'll also, once you're on these listservs, you'll probably see other ground truthers sending out messages to um, to the group to try to organize their own trips and that's totally great we definitely encourage that and and like we shared earlier um, if folks do want to do that and check in with us about where would be some good places to go that's great and you can borrow some of our gear um, another way if you want to do it if you want to like go out um, and practice with a friend or something like that and you know you want to go camping somewhere. Um, I definitely encourage folks to get in touch about that because you know we we do a lot of campouts throughout the spring and the summer, and we might be able to to give you some some good pointers on some places to camp that maybe also have some some ground truthing that needs to be done nearby, so you can kind of um, feed two birds with one seed there. And you can also organize your own trip on the listserv, like I said, just by sending a message out and saying something like, you know, this is this is when I want to go. I'm able to drive. Um, right now we're using COVID protocols that um, so we can't really organize carpools ourselves. And we have, you know, throughout the summer, this is going to be sort of shifting um, depending on what happens with COVID, but you know we we are kind of capping our our uh, our size um, our group size limits for these trips based on on what's happening throughout the year. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, you can you can borrow all of our stuff. We can tell you the best places to go, and we're going to be sending out a follow up email to this presentation um, with more details about kind of what to expect and, and some information on some upcoming field days. We've definitely got a whole bunch of them scheduled throughout the spring and summer, uh, including a few campouts as well. So yeah, I guess Misha, do you wanna, is there anything that you wanna add to that? Um, that, that covers most of it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna send, you all an email with a feedback survey um, about this training. Um, I would really appreciate if you took a few minutes to fill it out. It helps us um, improve the training for the future. Um, and there was one other thing that I was going to say. Oh, um, we have some more like training resources and information about field days up on the website that I'm going to send you in a follow-up email. Um, 
that's all new. So if you have any feedback on it, and it's also going to be like added to over time. So check that out if you want more resources and please send me any comments or suggestions that you have. Yep. Yeah, so I think we want to open things up now and just see if anyone has any questions about anything we talked about or maybe didn't talk about that that you're wondering um, about or have questions. Um, yeah, we've got a little bit of time. So if anyone has anything, you can go ahead and, and fire away. Yeah, be two birds with one seed. That's a little less violent. Yeah, I never <laughs> heard that either. Oh, that was cute. <laughs> I'll make that up. Yeah, I thank you both so much. Really interesting presentation um, and a lot, a lot of good information. I was wondering, um, Michael, you were talking, you mentioned just kind of like briefly, and I was going to ask you at that moment, but then um, Misha, you started talking and I was like, oh, I don't want to interrupt. Um, but I wrote it down was like, just a thought popped into my mind, like, do you go back to the units um, post, you know, let's say the logging does happen. I think it was like kind of on the old growth in part of the unit, but do you like go back to reevaluate um, or reassess, you know, like if they did actually what they said they were going to do, or is, is, there, is that just too much time and commitment that you don't have resources? No, we definitely do that. Um... I would say that depending on other projects that we have going on, um, some some years we do more of it than others. But you know, there was there was definitely a few years there, like when I first started on staff with Bark, that we were doing almost as much of that as we were the pre timber sale ground truth thing, and that was a really great learning experience um, to be able to see kind of how these timber sales ended up actually playing out on the ground and, you know, what the temporary roads looked like that they built into the forest, for example, and, you know, how, how big the riparian buffers actually ended up being and, and whether or not some of these riparian areas ended up being buffered at all. And it was actually a really great, um, I mean, it was kind of, a, it was a tough learning curve to be able to kind of know what to what to focus on with all of that, because there's, there can just be so much. Um, but we ended up um, doing a few years of that and then having a few years where we were consistently meeting with the Forest Service and sharing some of our findings. And it actually, from what I observed, uh, it resulted in pretty positive results in terms of you know, we were able to identify some issues that kept rising to the surface that were inconsistent with what some of the Forest Service documents had kind of planned for. And, um, and the Forest Service were able to then, you know, adjust some of their, their language and their documents or practices accordingly. And I think that since then, I've, def I've definitely noticed more consistency in, like, for example, temporary roads being actually um, blocked off after they're used or, you know, riparian buffers actually being the right size. I think there's kind of this, there's this piece of ground truthing where um, I've actually heard from the Forest Service directly that just, you know, it does, sometimes it doesn't even matter what we bring to the table. The fact that they know that we're out there walking all these timber sales, both before and after really creates this higher level of accountability for them where they're much less likely to propose stuff that is outrageous or, you know, not follow through with things that they said they were going to do. So it's definitely valuable. And, and like I said, on Thursday, I hope we can do a little bit about of that this summer too. And in looking at some of the temporary roads that, that were built up on the North side of the, of the Mount hood. So it's not always the most uplifting part of this work. And, um, can sometimes involve walking through slash and um, you know you're it's it's a lot uh, drier and sunnier <laughs> in the summertime so uh, it's different different work but really important so yeah I appreciate you bringing it up uh, there's a question do we mark on the map or on a map slash app the exact locations where we make observations um, and measurements on the form. Um, so we'll do more training in Avenza when we're actually out on the field. But yeah, when you make an observation on Avenza, you will mark, mark exactly 
where, let's see, I'm not, I'm not totally sure that I am understanding exactly what you're asking. So I'm going to answer it and then tell me if I missed it. Um, but so on Avenza, you do mark exactly the where the are that the observations that you make um, for the measurements like canopy cover or slope. I like to mark those on Avenza because I think it gives a nice idea of like where, you know, the slope or canopy closure um, changes throughout the unit, but that's not necessarily something that you have to mark. Um, the things that we really ask that you mark, we put little like pictures next to um, on the phone that's like, this is a really great thing to get a photo of. And like, we really want photos of, you know, the forest structure and of the plants, etc. cetera. Um, so let me know if I didn't answer that. Michael, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's great. Like, yeah, that's the great thing about Avenza is that it really does provide us that that specific information. So when, for example, we find old growth trees that might contain red tree voles or, you know, uh, a rare plant, we can we can provide that information directly to the Forest Service um, so they know exactly where to go to, to look for those things and, and mark them on the ground. So. Um, yeah, I think you answered that pretty well. There's a question on here about what kind of pass is required to access the areas. And so for, for most of these areas that we're going, there's no, no pass required. Um, for some of like the recreation sites and the trails and stuff like that, sometimes there's the Northwest Forest Pass on the National Forest that's required. But um, actually for Mount Hood, there's not very many sites that really require that. Another example is um, ODOT has some some places along the main roads, especially up um, kind of uh, closer to like Hood River or Rhododendron and you know along 26, 48, Highway 35 that require snow park pass, but that's also not year round. So for the most part, no no pass is needed. I wouldn't I wouldn't ever expect that folks would need that for, for ground truthing. Um, Amara, did you wanna speak? Yeah, I was just um, wondering, cause it seems like there are, just looking at the maps, it, there are a lot of units depending on, I guess, whatever the quota is that they have to meet uh, for logging. But mm -hmm. so it seems like a lot of land or area to cover, units to cover. And I'm just curious about like how much time exists like when a sale is proposed and like but for all of these units, are they all staggered in time or are they kind of like all pro projected at once and then they go through the process of being assessed and then analyzed and ground truth by this this team of cool people. Um, and then like if there's some urgency to that or like if you have have like multiple teams going at different times to the same unit um, to collect data from different points of view and different eyes and um, I'm just curious about all of that and how that kind of aspect of it works. Yeah, so I can I can try to answer some of those questions. I guess first in regards to the timelines. So usually I would say on average from the point where we get a scoping letter or at least like a unit map for a timber sale, usually we see about a year and a half to two years until the actual decision on that project is signed. And so within that amount of time, we'll get at least one full field season to be able to walk those units. Um, but there's there's examples of other, you know, especially nowadays, they're moving forward projects really, really fast. Like a lot of the post-fire quote unquote salvage projects and, um, and other projects that are on a quicker timeline. And then, Let's see, your question, you were, you were asking about like how quickly all of those different units are logged. So I would say also kind of on average, like once that timber sale is approved and um, a timber contract is, is written up with a, a private company, usually 
I would say again, on average, like those timber sales get logged within one to half, one and a half to three years. Although sometimes, especially depending on like what the, what the market is doing, um, that can really vary. And that can be a really big issue because actually what we saw, like when I kind of first started with Bark was that uh, we just saw the, you know, the recession had just happened and, and there was this period or was happening. And there was this period of time where a lot of timber sales were being bid on all over the place, but then the, the companies were just kind of sitting on them and waiting until the market improved and they could sell the wood for, um, for more money. So they were, they were doing things like requesting extensions on their contracts so they could then you know, log all the trees when, when it was best for them. And what that, that's problematic because what that does is um, it creates a situation where like the total logging at one given time across the landscape increases uh, in this way that wasn't really anticipated when the projects were being originally planned. So that's, that's something we haven't really seen that happen in that way since that recession happened. Um, and with things <laughs> moving out how they are now, I don't really know what to expect. It's just a, it's a odd situation with the, the prices of lumber with all of the, uh, the post fire <laughs> landscape. But does that answer your question? I feel like there was one other part too. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that, yeah, you answered my question, the first part of it, because I was asking too about just the, the, I guess, you know, how much time we have to all go out on in different teams or pairs or to explore one unit or multiple units. And it sounds like there's a lot of opportunity, plenty of time so that it's not something that has to hurry up and happen in a lot of different spaces. So there's room for that. So thank you, yeah. Yeah, and that was the other piece, yeah, you were talking about priority units and doubling up on units and stuff. And I would say it's, it's not very often that just because these timber sales can be so big that we're able to ground truth every square inch and, every, and even every single unit. Um, but, you know, Misha and I are going to be choosing units that Bark is prioritizing for different reasons and, and starting with those. And sometimes if there's a, a major issue there, we will revisit those units or, or send more people. It just kind of depends on, on what those issues are. Yeah. Um, so the, there's another question about uh, ground truthing protocol and whether we prefer people to go out in pairs or as individuals. Um, so I'm assuming this question is kind of like if you're going out on your own. Well, it can be for either. Um, if you're comfortable and confident with going out as an individual, um, there are ways to like take all these measurements on your own. Um, then that is fine with us. We don't require that you go with somebody else. Um, but obviously for like safety or if you're not comfortable, you know, being off trail by yourself um, or confident in like navigation skills, definitely can find, we can help you find somebody to go with um, if you don't have someone to go with, but you want to go outside of a field day. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I'll just add too, it's, it's pretty rare that people go out on their own. Um, but there are ways to, you know, some of these measurements are difficult to do by yourself. Um, like measuring slope is one of those things. Um, but there are ways to, to try to do that, you know, using flagging or, or looking at a particular part of a tree. Um, so those are, those are kind of some things that we, we might be able to dig into a little bit more once we get out into the field but we definitely always encourage folks to, to go out at least in pairs when, you know, when they're willing to and, and when it's possible. Safety is a big, a big thing for us. <laughs> is there something that folks should do if they're going out uh, by themselves? Anything that we recommend? 
Yeah. Like make sure you uh, tell someone else where you're going and how long you anticipate being out. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, I guess that's another thing that we should add. I have a, a lot of safety considerations on um, one of the web pages. Um, so those are all things that you should consider. Um, checking in with like Michael or I before you go out and when you come back. Um, or especially anytime you're gonna go outside by yourself, um, you know, like having your emergency contact, your person that you know is going to like respond uh, if you're gone for too long um, is important. Um, so I have like my sister is the person I always tell and say, here's when I expect to be back. Here's when you should be worried if you don't hear from me. Um, you can also, there's lots of like safety devices. You can get an emergency beacon um, or like satellite texting phones and such. Um, and we also, if you're going out to these places, we kind of have an idea of where a cell phone service is, especially in the, in the ground truthing areas that we've been to a lot. So we can communicate that so you know where you might get some cell phone service. And that might be something that you wanna think about when you're out there by yourself too. Um, it's like, oh, I have cell phone service here. If I need to like reach out to somebody, here's where I can go do that. Um, and there's a lot more safety safety things to consider. Yeah. yeah. If you want to talk about those. Yeah, yeah, there's a question about if, if folks have ever um, faced harassment. Um, I would say it's, it, that is, it's pretty, it's pretty rare. Um, it's happened before. And I don't know if it's too worth right now getting into examples and I don't want to like say anything that comes off as scary or anything like that but um there's there's never I would say there's never been any seriously scary situations there's been some creepy times and I think this you know it points to the value of you know especially if you're new this it is it's really great to um to pair up with folks um it's, I feel a lot safer when I'm out with, with other people. And we actually, we usually, I'm not sure how or when this is going to happen this year, but we have a, uh, a training that we usually do each year with the, uh, with the Rose Hips uh, Street Medic Collective, where we talk a, a lot about prevention um, for, you know, safety concerns, both, you know, environmental and social. Um, that exist out there in the forest. And um, so I'm definitely going to let folks know about that. And if that presentation for, for any reason doesn't happen in the capacity that has in the past, we actually have a whole, like we have training materials and stuff that, that we can provide that are, that are from that and, and can definitely talk more about those things um, when we go out to the forest and, and whatnot. But you know, we have some examples of like prevention, you know, like I would say we run into the most, I guess, conflicts of space. And I'm not talking about direct conflicts. I'm just talking about people being in the same space in the hunting season uh, when a lot of people are out there uh, hunting. And so, you know, we definitely during those times of year really make sure that we go over safety protocols for, you know, what to do if you're in an area where you realize somebody is shooting, um, we make sure that people are all equipped with things like whistles um, at all times, not just during the hunting season and uh, using, you know, wearing bright clothing so you can be seen, um, you know, definitely keeping lines of communication open so people always know where you're at and, and what time you're going to be back at a particular place when people can expect you, that kind of thing. So. Anyway, we can we can kind of go. It's a big question, and it's a and it's a, an important question, and I don't want to minimize it. Um, but uh, we can definitely talk more about that when we when we're out, and and maybe can have a little bit more dedicated space to it. Well, if there aren't any other additional questions or comments or anything else anyone has to share, I just want to say thank you all so much for being here on a sunny midday Saturday. It's so great um, to see you all and I'm really excited to, to spend more time with you out in the forest this 
this season. Thank you. Have a great day out there. <laughs>